Hey, it's Justin Dove of Core Image Studio. We have created branding for some of the biggest sports networks in America, including the Boston Red Sox, New England Patriots, Golden State Warriors, Tennessee Titans, St. Louis Blues, and many more. Here the difference Core Image Studio can make for your sports network. CoreImageStudio.com The Sound Off Podcast. The podcast about broadcast with Matt Kundal starts now. This week, I'm speaking with one of my dear friends, Rob Braid. Rob worked at Shome starting in 1977 and became program director through 1986 before he crossed the street to work for Standard Radio and run FM 96 and CJD 800 as general manager. Rob would continue working there until 2008 when he moved on to Astral and then Stingray, and now he's chairman of the board of the National Music Center in Calgary, but don't let that fool you, he's still living in Quebec. I got to work with Rob early in the millennium when Shome was purchased from Chum and became part of Standard Radio. I love Rob's passion for music, food, wine, Montreal, and radio. Wait a second, those are the exact same things I love. As we release this episode, it's hunting season, and I think back to bringing the staff some of the annual duck harvest and how much Rob would appreciate cooking with wild game. It's been too long for me and Rob. During non-COVID times, we would have had this discussion over a few drinks and some cuisine at his place in Old Montreal. But for now, this will suffice. Rob Ray joins me from his home in Lac du Pain Rouge in the Laurentians, north of Montreal. You know, I've always been afraid to do this interview with you because we could probably go on for two hours, and we might. <laughs> I'm all yours. How's Montreal doing these days? Because I was there a few months ago, and it feels like a giant construction zone. Montreal is a place I don't go very often. I live on a small lake north of Montreal. It's just about an hour and 10 minutes from old Montreal, where I keep a lovely condo. You know, cobblestone streets and gas lights and lovely restaurants and the best croissant on the planets. Montreal has gone through a fascinating rejuvenation over the past few years. There were no construction cranes for so many years, and now you can't swing a cat without hitting one, as they say. The economy is booming. The Quebec Inc. 2.0, there was Quebec Inc., and that was the burgeoning Quebec francophone business people who started up the new economy in Quebec. And it was based upon biotech and aerospace and information technologies. And then there was the second generation, Quebec Inc. 2.0. And that had to do, again, with much more knowledge-based industries, Ubisoft, the video gaming businesses and information technology that Montreal is so well known for. A massive influx of young intellectual property workers. A lot of Chinese middle-class money has come into the city. They have been building condo after condo after condo which has led to massive infrastructure changes, which has led to huge, huge traffic problems in the inner city. Waze is having a real hard time keeping track because things change on a daily basis. I mean, a huge new sub-industry for taxi drivers in Montreal is having people knock on their door who aren't from Montreal and saying, I've got to get to this place. I'll pay you to lead me there. I got into a taxi a few months back, and this guy had just made a whack of dollars because a South Asian family had arrived in Dorval and had been driving around Montreal. They needed to get to Laval, north of the city, and this guy couldn't find his way out of the city. So he pulled over this taxi driver. He had his whole family, this South Asian family in the back of the cab. They were lost. They had to get to Laval for a wedding, and he said, "I'll take me there. I'll follow you. All of my GPS is wrong. His wife got out of the minivan and got into the cab with the driver and said, I don't trust my husband. So, you know, this is what's happening in Montreal. It's crazy. So I don't go into town very often. I've spent maybe 12 nights at my condo in Old Montreal since March of 2020. The city is, however, thriving. The information and technology sector is exploding. The restaurants are still great. We were very careful as a province and even more so as a city during the pandemic. We were very cautious. As we speak, Alberta is going through the worst situation in the country's history of this pandemic. Alberta looks like the deep south of America at this point. It's a mess. They sort of let people free too early and they're paying the price now. 
depending on when people hear this, uh, hopefully things will have gotten better. But Montreal and Quebec in general did a good job. We're in pretty good shape. Our cases are still high, but they're not nearly as high as other places. I think the city's in good shape. We've got a mayoralty race coming up, which will be decided in November. Our former mayor, Denny Coderre, is making a play to come back with a more sort of right of center business orientation. And our existing mayor, Valerie Plant, who is far more left of center, is struggling to hold on. And anybody's guess because they're neck and neck. But I'm very positive about the city, and I think its future is very strong. The first call letters on your resume are CKCU, Carleton University. Why did you choose Carleton, and did you want to be in radio? I heard Dave Boxer play the Beatles in, I believe, 1964. And I remember I was living in Beaconsfield, and I was looking up the 40 didn't exist yet. I was born in 53, and I heard the Beatles, and I knew that I wanted to play music for people for the rest of my life. <laughs> That's when it started, Matt. So. I was one of the geeks who, you know, attached the clip of the rocket ship radio to my radiator and listened to Cousin Brucey and Arnie Woo Ginsburg on the skip at night, uh, hoping my parents wouldn't come in and catch me and was fascinated by all things musical. I started buying Beatles records when they started coming out. My mother introduced me to music long before I knew the Beatles and I was listening to Thelonious Monk and Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers and Charles Lloyd even before I heard of Elvis. I was always very musically oriented. Fortunately, I'm left-handed, and I was given a guitar right-handed. So as a result, I had this excited to sing. And fortunately, I was never able to play anything well enough to make my living at it. So I had to live on the periphery. Always knew I wanted to do radio. Carleton University came into my sights. I always wanted to work at Shulm. I grew up two blocks away from Shulm on Wood Avenue in Westmount, an area I know you know well because you grew up just a couple of blocks away from that. And I went to Westmount High School. So I couldn't walk down the side of the street where Shulm was because my heart would beat too heavily in my chest in the late 60s and early 70s. I went off to Carleton University because they had a student radio station that was CKCU. And you had to be a student to be involved in radio stations. So I signed up for medieval history and finally realized if I heard the name St. Thomas Aquinas again, I was going to lose my mind. So I switched over to study for my master's thesis in music. We made Radio Carlton, CKCU-FM, the first semi-commercial student station in Canada and put it on the air in 1975. And two years after that, one of Shom's founding fathers, Angus Mackay, a man you knew very well through your family and as a personal friend, got in touch with me and said that Shom was looking for an all-night guy. I had applied four or five times before that been brushed aside by a couple of different program directors. Well, somehow, by hook or by crook, I got the job at Shom as the all-night guy for $400 a month. I threw the master's thesis over my shoulder and ran off to join the circus. So Radio Carlton was a hugely important part of my life, my career, and it gave me an opportunity to understand the quality of content and the purpose of high expression and something I always tried to carry with me and still to this moment. So why Shom? Because you're near Green Avenue. You were two blocks away. I was three blocks away from Green Avenue. But, you know, CKGM was also there as well. So it was more than just the radio. It was really the characters on 1355 Green Avenue, like Denny Grandin and Angus Mackay and the people and the music that made Shom so special. Shom was an attraction to me on a number of different levels. We moved a lot when I was a kid. And I never was really able to put down very solid roots in places that we moved to. And I didn't have a lot of close friends when we arrived in Westmount. And it wasn't until I discovered Hash and Jimi Hendrix and The Doors and Led Zeppelin and dark places and spots where you weren't supposed to go that I started to develop a circle of friends. And we all listened to that music. And all of a sudden, there was Sean playing that music. And I would listen to Angus Mackay, who became my dearest friend and was my best man at my first wedding and was the godfather of my first child. And very, very close associations with the philosophy and the feelings and the incredible expressions of music, you know, classic rock when it was new. And Shom was a very logical association for me. You know, I listened to CKGM, I listened to C Fox, I listened to AM Radio Top 40, as many of us did. And in fact, probably like many people at the very beginning claimed I listened to Shom, but actually listened to CKGM. You know, it's people who claim that they voted for somebody other than Trump, but actually voted for Trump. 
you know, it's hiding at the ballot box. But I think ultimately, it was the change. It was 1969. It was who we became. It's the promises we made as a generation, most of which we broke. And now with my 22-year-old daughter making new promises that hopefully her generation won't break, that was our opportunity for change. That was who we were going to become. And it was being expressed by Jimmy and Janice and Jim. You know, so many of the stories that you've told over the years, I mean, I've been lucky to hear them. And then I try to reproduce them to someone else. And I'm just happy that you're here now. So you can tell the story and I can just refer people back to the podcast. Can you tell me about the use of French on English radio stations and why when radio stations made an attempt to deliver content in a bilingual nature that there was pushback and eventually it was you know sort of banned outright? You know, Matt, this story is the most important part of Shom. This is why Shom needs to be so widely celebrated. Shom had its 50th anniversary a couple of years back, and one of the founding fathers who lives out west now called me up and was a little nonplussed because he felt that his contribution wasn't being as widely recognized as he felt it should be. And he's a great guy and a brilliant broadcaster. And he wasn't pulling an ego trip. He was just surprised that there wasn't more focus on those who had gone before. But I said, listen, you guys, us guys, aren't the story. The story was that early Shom was the meeting of two cultures that had never met before. Shom offered francophones and francophone music, a place in the sandbox where anglophones hung out and allophones hung out. You have to understand everybody was so pleased that we were speaking a little bit of French. You know what? French Canadians didn't hear their own music on French radio. There was no harmonium and beau dommage being played. There was no Diane Dufresne. There was no Robert Charlebois being played on French radio. Schoen played that music. Schoen played Genesis, Gentle Giant, the big operatic rock that Juan Rodriguez and the Montreal Star once suggested that Francophones loved because it reminded them of the church music of their childhood. I'm sure there's been more master's theses done on that than you can shake a stick at. Schoen was the meeting place. It was where the cultures came together and held hands. As the FLQ was rising up, as the two solitudes were becoming more separate on a political level, they were coming together on a social level. I'll never forget, and it's one of the great stories of all time in the history of Montreal Radio, maybe North America, when the FLQ, the Front de Libération du Québec, which was the terrorist separatist organization, stormed into Chaume on Green Avenue and took over the radio station. Fists clenched in the air, hooting and hollering. And this was in the middle of mailboxes exploding and people being kidnapped and assassinated. And the FLQ walked into the studio and they took over Shom. And they insisted that their manifesto be read. DJ said, sure, go ahead. I have no problem. Read your manifesto. It's cool. They smoked a joint, read the manifesto. And then what were they going to do? He said, well, what do you want to hear? And they sat around the studio for a few hours and played their favorite records. Genesis, Gentle Giant, Super Tramp, Krista Burr. That was cool. That's what it was, you know. And there was more of that going on than there was the horrors that manifested some very painful change. Shom applied. I was there. I made the application when I was program director. We had an experimental bilingual license. And listen, Matt, right now I spend 70% of my life in French. I'm fluently, idiomatically bilingual. I watch more French news and read more French newspapers than I do English. And back then, I was a bloke from Westmount. I, I used to go and smoke a joint during French class because I wasn't interested, like most Anglo kids did back then in the 60s. And when I got to Shome, Bob Beauchamp had to teach me how to say that was coming up next and the weather for the weekend is. I mean, I didn't have that level of French. Westmount was a walled village. You know that. You're younger than I am, but, you know, you came in on the tail of that. So we were able to speak a bit of French. So we went in front of the CRTC at Jeff Sterling's behest and asked for a permanent French license. And the gang of four, I've always called them, the four Francophone broadcasters, lined up in front of the CRTC and said that if Schoen was able to play English music and speak French, it would erode the French culture. Well, quite the opposite had been happening. It had been encouraging the French culture. It had been encouraging Anglophones to listen to French music. And it had been allowing Francophones to listen to French music, too. 
Well, of course, they were just concerned that we'd take all their advertising money. So the CRTC said that we couldn't. I remember the Globe and Mail the next day wrote an editorial saying that they were shocked that the only organization in the entire country willing to recognize official bilingualism in Canada had been denied by the federal government. Pierre Trudeau was out of his mind. So lo and behold, much to the surprise and chagrin of the Francophone broadcasters, shortly thereafter, the CRTC came to them and said, okay, here's the deal. If you're so concerned about French culture, you're now going to play 65% French music. And that's where that started. And to this day, French broadcasters have to play 65% French music. And the impact of that has been net extremely positive. The reason for that is, in order to differentiate themselves, and this was the law of unintended consequences, believe me, in order to differentiate themselves, because there wasn't that much French music around then, there is now, but back then there wasn't. Sequa, Sequa MF, those stations, CFGL, you know what they did? They built big morning and afternoon comedy shows. They didn't have a lot of music to play because they had to play 65% French. There's only so much Robert Charlebois. So they started Dingy Dong, Roque Bézare, Les Grands Gueules. And they developed an unbelievable comedy situation in Montreal. That's why Quebec is such an incredibly strong comedy market. It was because the French stations had to play 65% French because Chaume wasn't allowed to speak French. A lot of unintended consequences. It's had a trickle-down effect for decades, in effect, generations. Now, nothing has changed in terms of Shom's audience, Matt. Shom's audience was 70% Francophone then, and it's 70% Francophone now. Francophones, allophones, and anglophones are all interested in what's going on internationally. There's always been a great interest in what's going on globally, even more amongst Francophones, because they have a curiosity as to what the rest of the planet's doing. Anglophones in North America tend to look up their own asses. Francophones are much more curious intellectually. So long way of answering your story. French was a, an important part of Sholmes' history because I believe it helped Francophones discover things that they otherwise wouldn't have been able to, including their own culture. You had to make a decision in 1987 to move on from Sholm. How hard was it leaving? I mean, it seems obvious you get to become the general manager over at CJD and FM 96, but was it hard to leave Shom then? The hardest part of it was that I had a show called Road Test Montreal, and I got a new car every Monday. I got a new car every Monday. And I traveled all over the world testing cars. I mean, I actually was flown to a thousand kilometers east of Moscow on the Volga River in the Kum Desert to test a Lada car. And I mean, I can't tell you the stories. And I was the track announcer at the Grand Prix. And anyway, I was doing open wheel racing. That's the first thing that jumped into my mind, seriously. So I called up Gary Slade, who would ask, offer me the job. And he said, all right, you can have whatever car you want for the rest of the time you work. So I drove some great cars. But anyway, I had approached Chum on several occasions because I'd been there for about a decade. And I started as the all night guy, and as you, know, as you did, and you know, everybody who got to where we got to. Worked my way up. I became music director and then program director and ipso facto general manager, even though I was never given the job title. So I went to Chum on a few occasions. Lee Hamilton was the manager by that point, and Fred Sherratt was kind of ops guy in Toronto. And I went to them both, and I said, so, you know, so what's, what's next for a young broadcaster like me? Oh, well, you got a great future with Chum, and, you know, stick around. we got plans for you. And it's wonderful. Great. Okay, go back to Montreal and get into that office and program show. And then they gave me CKGM to run. And within six months, I was able to run both of them into the ground because it was too much to do. Both years later, poor Martin Spalding was given 26 stations to run. But anyway, it was a different world then. They never gave me any kind of a, a vision of my future, Matt. I was never, I was never given a hope that there would be a, some kind of career. And Gary and I had known each other pretty well over the years. He was running Q107. His family owned it. And we had met at Burkhardt Abrams conferences with Lee Abrams and Kent Burkhardt around North America for a few years, and we saw eye-to-eye -eye on things. And he'd offered me a, a shift job once before, actually, programming Q in Toronto, along with Bob Makowitz as my co-program director. I love Bob, but thank God that didn't happen. Jaws, we used to call him. And to the extent my wife at the time had gone to Toronto to look for places. And I turned him down finally, and he called me back a couple of years later, and he said, okay, that's it. We want you out of there and into our place, because Alan had just bought Standard from Conrad Black. 
So, you know, he gave me the deal and it was great. And I walked out to Green Avenue and down to 4th Street. And it was terrifying in, in a certain way because I was in my mid-30s. And I was not a CJAD kind of guy. That was my mother's radio station. I don't think I'd ever heard Jack Finnegan before in my life. And here I was, his boss, you know, the legendary Jack Finnegan and George Balkan and Ted Blackman and Gord Sinclair. And I didn't know what I was doing. And so I just sat them all down in the office one day and I said, I have no idea what I'm doing here. You tell me what you need and I'll make it happen. That was the beginning of a, a good relationship with all of them. But it was a tough call, but one that I knew I had to make if I was going to get ahead in life. Just three years before you made that decision to leave Shome. You did something rather profound, and that's you hired Terry DeMonte in 1984 to become the morning man at Shom. Did you know it would work out so well? Yeah. Yeah, right away. John Paracol called me up, a consultant. One of the real original thinkers I've ever met in my life called me up, and he said, there's a guy. And he knew that I needed a morning man because Ron Abel, who ended up going back to Winnipeg, was leaving. And I needed a morning person, and I needed a self-starter. I needed somebody. I've always believed in the horizontal management and horizontal interaction in a human dynamic. I don't like vertical stratification. And I wanted to find somebody who I could say, okay, off you go. Do what you want. And I met Terry, and I knew that this was a resourceful, intelligent human being, somebody who got it, who didn't walk around with a swollen head, somebody who didn't expect to fly business class that a cheap bottle of rye was just as good as a bottle of Crown Royal, a person's person, and funny and intelligent and bright and engaging. He gave a shit. And, you know, his head wasn't all swollen up. And I knew that in the first few seconds that I spoke to him. It's one of those things you can just judge. I'm not a bad judge of character. Got me you, you know, <laughs> and you turned out pretty darn good. So Terry was a easy hire. And he and I have blown some sunshine up each other's butts in the past few months because of his departure and the 50th anniversary of Shome and a couple of things in his standing by podcast he's had to say. And, you know, there's a lot of love between the two of us. And that love is because I made him sound good and he made me look good. Throughout all those years, being a general manager, do you have any favorite programmers? Well, you're certainly, I mean, I've always respected your programming abilities as much as anybody else's. Pat Holiday's got to be at the top of the list. He's a genius. Blair Bartram is incredible, but Blair's programming genius extends more to the marketing and promotion side of things. Blair is one of the smartest people I've met. He wasn't easy to direct as a program director, but boy, is he a clever human being and inspirational for his staff. You know, Bob Harris, I mean, there's so many of them. Rick Moffat was a great PD at CJD. Ted Blackman was a remarkably intuitive program director, just a curmudgeonly prick half the time. Boy, he had a great sense of the street. I don't think I had anybody in a programming role, and my brain's rushing through 22 years. I don't think there was anybody that I put in a programming role that I ever regretted doing that. Jeff Fiddler built Mix 96, you know, a remarkably intuitive, analytical mind. Everybody, I think, that I was able to put in there. And, you know, Gary Slate was a huge, huge part of making those decisions. I never made a decision on my own to put anybody in a programming seat. Gary was a very, very involved owner. He always let me do what I wanted to do, but he always had input, strong input. And all of his stations, you know that, Matt. And I never made a decision in a vacuum. Gary was always part of it. And I think that's one of the reasons that all those PDs worked out so well. I'm glad you mentioned Jeff Fiddler, by the way, because Jeff is bringing that same research and insight that, you know, he used to help build Mix 96 into the podcast space right now. And a lot of podcasters are getting a lot out of Signal Hill Insights. I worked with Jeff when he was at Joint with Dave Charles and John Paracol. And when I was able to bring him into Montreal to program Mix 96, it was as much of a shock to the system as it was bringing Pat Holiday in. It was a massive, massive change to the body politic. Here was an intellectual, obsessive, compulsive kind of had to get it right 
knew stuff that nobody else knew. He was the first guy who walked in and said, okay, I'm a high analytical individual. I'm going to show you why this is going to work. And Jeff loved being the PD because he used to say, I love this job because I've been a road warrior for most of my career. And I fly into Poughkeepsie and I give these people all these things to do. And they got all excited and they come back six months later, nothing's changed. He said, here, I can actually push a button and make it happen and see what comes out the other end. And with Jeff, nothing but success came out the other end. So yeah, you know, I'm not a light religious man, but in the Koran, they say you're thrice blessed when you have this much good fortune. Inside your office, there was the original 1984 Mac. You're an Apple fan. Why did you fall in love with Apple products? My mother. My mother died 35 years ago, and she was an art historian. And just before she passed, my dad bought her the very first Macintosh. In fact, I still have it. It's in a box just a few meters away from me here. And it's one of the originals that was signed by Steve Jobs and Wozniak. I can't imagine what it's worth today. And it's one of those ones you had the Microsoft Word diskettes you had to put in and out four or five times before you could boot the thing up. I remember the first external drive I bought for it was a 200 meg hard drive and it cost $600. I still had the original dot matrix printer. My mother was pretty far ahead of her time, and she forced me to take, I didn't have to take French classes at Westmount High, but I had to take typing classes. And it was almost one of those, I don't want to beat you, I have to beat you situations, you know. But I, I'm a real quick five-finger typist or 10-finger typist as a result. So I, I migrated to the Mac, and that machine was the beginning of an iOS path that I've never varied from. In fact, I'm a little grumpy here today with you because I had to change my default browser to Chrome in order to do this thing with you because your software doesn't work on Safari. So I've committed a cardinal sin in the iOS environment. And the moment I'm off this thing, I'm rushing back to Safari again. So there. That's true about Squadcast. They haven't figured out how to do that yet. So there's a few things that's forced us to go back and forth. Was the 1998 ice storm your most difficult crisis to manage? Huh, that's a big question. I suppose it was. In terms of physicality, yeah, I guess so. I mean, that was so many crises rolled into one. That was the classic super tramp title, Crisis What Crisis? When you thought you'd dealt with one crisis, another one popped up. You know, the towers went down, and then we realized we could find another transmitter site. And then the next crisis came up was because we couldn't get fuel to it because the electricity was down where the gas pumps were. And where we could get gas, we couldn't take the gas through the Louis Hippolyte La Fontaine tunnel because that wasn't allowed. And then the next crisis was when Jim Duff resigned in a huff, one of our midday show hosts, because we wouldn't take CJD signal and put it on Mix 96, which the CRTC said we could do, but we probably would have a hard time getting it back onto AM and replacing Mix 96 again because our license on Mix 96 too was to serve a certain audience. And just crisis after crisis after crisis kept on coming up. I guess probably you could say that it was the greatest crisis of my career. There were others that tended to be having to do with people. You know, engineering George Balkan's departure from the morning show at CJAD was certainly a crisis. The death of Gord Sinclair, death of Ted Blackman. Certainly, these were all crises of different natures, Matt. They may not have been as explosive and sexy in McLuhan-esque terms, but they had really massive trickle-down effects on the operation and the threat, which we now see the ultimate result of, was the decrease of the journalistic orientation of CJAD, which is, with all due respect to the people running CJAD on the ground right now, has basically been torn apart by Bell Media, who is not focused on content in any way, shape, or form, but rather is, like most of the telcos, rushing off in the direction of distribution and mobile and leaving content to sort of strangle slowly on the floor. I saw that coming a long time ago. It's arrived. But at each of these major events where we were hit in the nuts journalistically, I saw that getting a little closer. 
that was a kind of an existential crisis that I watched sort of develop during my career. And I'd say overall, declining support for Canadian cultural imperatives, which included journalism, would have been the biggest crisis. I think that I spent a lot of time in my career trying to defend the social contract that exists between broadcasters and the Canadian public. And that's something that I don't think that broadcast owners have any respect for anymore. I'd say that's the largest crisis I've faced. In just a second, Rob and I talk about a few more things he encountered as general manager of Standard Radio in Montreal, including the purchase of Shome from Chum, Life After Standard Radio, the National Music Centre in Calgary, and what he thinks should be done about those pesky radio regulations that have not been changed since 1997. The show, as always, is brought to you by our friends at Promo Suite. Not sure if you saw this in the trades recently, but Promo Suite has unleashed something new Promo Suite Digital. Built specifically for radio stations, Promo Suite Digital allows you to customize your workflow to manage your digital creative process. Manage your station and clients' digital assets across all channels. Whether it's websites, social media pages, YouTube channels, banner ads, or anything else that falls under digital, you can do it with Promo Suite Digital, and it's all in one centralized place. Streamline your efforts, speed up your processes, and eliminate duplications of efforts, promotions, production, and now digital. Yet another example of how Promo Suite is pivoting with the times to make your life a whole lot easier. Your station can give this a try now by calling 212-509-1200 and asking for Rachel or Drew or by going to promosuite.com slash sound off. That's promosuite.com slash sound off. You know, a lot of people ask me about the sound quality on the podcast and it's often because I'm recording with Squadcast. It's my favorite way to record audio remotely. All that's needed is a good internet connection, a Google Chrome or Firefox browser, and we're good to go. Now, I know a lot of people like to use Zoom because it's easy and everyone knows it, but it's not built for podcast audio. It's built for corporate meetings. And you don't want your podcast to sound like a Zoom corporate meeting, do you? Oh, and by the way, in the last few months, they've also added video. So if you're into streaming and YouTube and you like kicking your video conversations out to multiple platforms, Squadcast has you covered. So get Squadcast by going to squadcast.fm and start your 30-day free trial. And when you make a purchase for either video or audio packages from Squadcast, just use the promo code SOUNDOFF at checkout for $20 off. That's promo code SOUNDOFF for $20 off with Squadcast. Go to squadcast.fm. The Sound Off Podcast. In 2002, you had to steer, at least on the ground, the purchase of Shom, which came over from Chum, and sort of integrating it into Ford Street. One of your early moves, I might say, that was bright, was bringing me in. That was a great move. But in terms of getting it all together, that was was a big job. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't. We had this great guy, Jeff Smith, who had built the original show boards and studio and put up the transmitters. He had also built the FM96 equipment. He uh, was working with Mark Cavanaugh, the genius studio and transmitter guy. Jeff helped us build the new equipment in record time. The psychological integration of the operations was made easier by the fact Terry was coming over. I had been there. Martin was coming over. You were coming over. The family was moving together. You know, there were some people who didn't come. We offered Mary a work and he ran off in a huff. There were a few people who didn't come over. We tried to move Ian McLean to Ottawa. He turned that down. We offered him the job of general manager of our Ottawa operation. Neil Kushner, Neil, who's a, a pal and who helped me out on some consulting work with Sirius XM a couple of a few years ago, thinks that we didn't offer him to come over. I remember we did. We were trying to move as much of the family down the street as we could, Matt. And I think that it was made easier by doing that. There were some people at Shome who turned out to be fairly negative influences in that transition. They'll remain nameless. There was a lot of stuff that went missing, you know, some gold records and some memorabilia that we never saw again. One one thing that came close to disappearing was the Shome door, the heart-shaped door, which was being put in a dumpster. It was being thrown away by former owners. And it was somebody in senior management who was bitter about the transaction. 
So anyway, uh, this was found out. The door was salvaged. And in fact, the architect who was building the new studios was grumpy as hell because he had to completely redo the air conditioning ducts and the size of the door going into the studio because it's an off-size door. It now hangs in a kind of a Hall of Fame space outside the Shome studio on Papineau and René Levesque. But we salvaged the door because through that door had gone so many greats and it had been so important. And I'll never forget the day that we opened the station, and it was Terry's first morning on the air. And we had Peter Trent, then the mayor of Westmount, because uh, Mayor Bork of Montreal refused to come in and welcome Shome to Montreal, because it had been in Westmount. <laughs> Peter Trent, bless him, came in with a certificate welcoming CJAD to Westmount. I'm not quite sure how that worked out, but anyway... We were fortunate in that Chris DeBerg had been playing the night before. And as you know, Chris has always been a great fan and a friend of the radio station. In fact, I've got a gold record for Lady in Red over here somewhere. And, and in fact, Chris performed on, the I think, the 50th anniversary, and then he showed up on Terry's last show. So anyway, Chris walks down the hallway to go into the studio to see Terry, and there's a tear in his eye. And I said, you know, what's going on? Are you okay? He said, if not for that door... <laughs> he couldn't say anything else. The implication being, if not for that door, his career never would have happened. And I think we transferred the spirit over pretty well. And I didn't find it that difficult. I didn't find it that stressful. I was chuffed. I mean, it was difficult to move down the street, but I knew it was a career move. It was fucking sweet to bring the station down to where I was working and to have it under my wing again, to have all you lot involved. You do remember that you launched three morning shows all at once again, right? On one day? Yeah. <laughs> I never looked at it quite that way <laughs> and, and had to love them all equally. The Montreal Expos could be coming back to Montreal. And I think back to 2000 when you were renegotiating the rights for the Expos for CJD. And you said the Expos play in a market the size of Dayton, Ohio. We're not cutting a big check. What do you think the future is for the Expos on radio in Montreal? Somebody will run it. TSN, I guess, would be the logical choice. 98.5 on the French side. It's hard to say. My son was roughed up in the schoolyard at Centennial because Jack Todd accused me of losing the Expos to Montreal because I wouldn't sign a broadcast deal with them. And those owners, DeLorean and his boy, they were just pricks. They were opportunists, and that played out again when they got involved in the Florida team, and they were never anybody's friends except their own. We knew as an organization standard that there was no money in sports broadcasting. We also had an ownership perspective because we owned the Toronto Raptors, and we knew how difficult sports media was. The timing was propitious because we were losing money on the Expos. We also had the Alouettes. And I got a call from Ronald Corey. And he said, listen, I'll give you the Canadians for free. Give me airtime. Give me a good broadcast. I need the Montreal Canadians on a strong Montreal station because they'd been on CFCF. And oh, by the way, you get Dick Urban in the mix. So we went through many seasons. And, you know, I just pulled the plug on, on Deloria and Samson, and they were on the way out the door anyway. And that may have been something of a proverbial straw, but I didn't like dealing with them. The play-by-play -play was spectacular. Dave Van Horn, of course, one of the greats of all time. You know, Elliot Price. I saw Elliot two days ago at Skip Snare's wake. It was wonderful to see him. He's still vital and a happening individual. Whether or not this will happen, whether or not we'll be splitting a season with Northern Florida, I, I, just, I just don't know. 40 home games, Peel Basin sitting there waiting for a building. I know that uh, Mitch Garber said he'd spoken to Stephen Bronfman as recently as a couple of days ago, and, you know, that Stephen still gives it a 50-50 possibility that this will happen. With the way the conversation's been going, you know, depending on when you watch this or listen to this podcast, information is probably going to be arriving pretty quickly. I think that there's not a lot of money in sports broadcasting, Matt. I don't think much has changed since the early aughts. I don't think that there's a lot of traditional media money to be put into sports. Now, if I was running an online concern, if I was looking at putting baseball games on the web, 
that would be a different situation. There's money there because the web didn't exist. Back then, the internet was only seven years old at that time, or even less. So now, yeah, you could put a product together. Certainly soccer's done that. A lot of other sports have done that. We can go to the web and they'll pay the money necessary. And, you know, the infrastructure is less. And now everything's being done virtually. I think it's going to be much easier for play-by-play to happen without having to jet huge play-by-play teams around North America or the world. So it's, it's a possibility. Matt, I got to tell you, I'm not a sports guy. And it gave me a great advantage because I negotiated with the best of them, Boivin and others for rights, Arnold Corey for the rights on the Canadians and Deloria for the Expos and Smith for the Alouettes. I've negotiated with them all. And I could never be sort of seduced by saying, oh, well, you know, we'll give you those seats over there. And I mean, I remember Francois Seigneur took me to the new Bell Center when the top wasn't even on it. I said, okay, well, pick your seats, pick your box, pick your load. So I picked the seats that I wanted. We had a whack of them in our deal. And it was like, yeah, whatever. I didn't care because I never went. I didn't watch. I'm not a sports guy. And that stood me in good stead because they couldn't kind of dangle sugar plum fairies in front of my head to get better deals. I went in for a business deal. And when there was no business deal for the Expos, I walked away. In 2007 or eight, the Slate family sold Standard to Astral. And at that time, what was your future going to be and what happened? The carpet was pulled out from underneath my feet. It was my intention to work for Gary for the rest of my life. I love the guy. Very close friends. And it hit me very hard. Astral ended up offering me a position, a corporate vice presidency of branding, communications, and industry relations. And I moved from Fort Street to Papineau and René Levesque into a completely francophone environment. This was before I developed the level of bilingualism that I have now, and it was a difficult social shift for me. And there's a competitive thing amongst francophone business people, which they do to themselves as well as to those not part of their linguistic group. They speak extremely quickly. And I found that at Stingray Digital, which I went to subsequently, and there's almost a competition to see how little you can have your associate understand of what you're saying. And I don't say this in any kind of denigrating way. But it's a business strategy, and it's interesting to observe. Well, that kicked me in the balls when I arrived on Papino, and I didn't really like the job very much. But what they did is they gave me $110 million to give away, uh, which was the transactional benefits that fell from that sale. When you sell a radio group, a specific percentage of the price, the selling price, falls to these transactional benefits which have to be spent to support the creation of music and to support identified groups, most specifically indigenous groups. So the majority of it was prescribed to go to the Radio Starmaker Fund, which is an organization that I happen to be chairman of, which supports touring and marketing for Canadian musicians. Another one is for Factor, an organization which helps emerging artists record music. And then there's a percentage which is discretionary. So I had about $10 million that I had to figure out what to do with. And I became the most popular guy in the Canadian music business for quite some time. And I traipsed around the country and was able to put programs together to hand out that money over a seven-year period. That was great. I enjoyed that very much. And we were involved in putting together the Virgin Deal with the Branson Group, which, you know, ultimately, I think has turned out something of a disaster for many of those stations. You know, I was in the room when Astral decided that they were going to rebrand Mix 96 to Virgin. And the ratings have never looked back. Unfortunately, they went to a much younger demo. And as history has shown, the beat, the Code to Code station is now wildly dominant. And Mix 96 or Virgin never picked up a fraction of its former audience. But they made that change because the deal with Virgin or Brands Group required that they rebrand a certain number of radio stations. That was a disappointment. And just around that time, Astro let go just a huge whack of Gary Slate's senior people. And treated me great, biggest severance that my attorney had ever seen in his career. And they gave me a contract immediately, never even left the office that day to continue to consult them. I kept the same assistant in parking space. And shortly after, I went into a management job with Jim West with uh, Justin Time Records, and we partnered for a little bit. 
great way to lose money managing an artist. And then Eric Boyko at Stingray offered me a job as VP of content and regulatory affairs. So the transition from Gary to my retirement over a period of seven, eight years, I suppose, was okay. Not the way I wanted to end off necessarily. Love the astral job part of it. Love the Stingray job part of it. Ended up opening a commercial kitchen with my son for small bat chefs and food trucks. And my last work was selling artisanal bacon to high end grocery stores in Montreal that was marinated in maple syrup and maple sugar. We were selling about 700 kilos of that a month. And when it got so big that it needed to be either scaled or shut down, I said, I'm out. I retired, shut the place down, and here we are. Tell me about the National Music Center. $200 million, state of the art building architectural wonder, award-winning, built around the old King Eddie Hotel, which was the dive bar of Calgary for years and decades. 2,000 instruments, performance spaces, about 15,000 school kids go through a year in non-COVID times for educational programs. We have the Rolling Stones mobile recording studio completely rebuilt to its original state in perfect analog shape. We have a brand new hand-built recording studio built around the Trident recording console on which Queen's Bohemian Rhapsody was recorded. In fact, my pal Tom Cochran and I were standing in there a couple of years ago. He looked down and he said, Jesus Christ. He said, that's the flanger that George Harrison used to record My Sweet Lord. Next door is another old classic style recording studio, comfy chairs, sofas, massive, massive speakers. Beautiful, so well soundproofed. The CP rail trains go by the window about 500 feet away, and you can't hear them. Next studio over is the Olympic studio console on which the Sex Pistols was recorded, never mind the Bullocks. It's got a great deal of beautiful exhibition space, and it's got all the halls of fame in the entire country. So that's the Juno's Karras, the Songwriters Hall of Fame. The Country Music Hall of Fame, which was just announced, and believe it or not, the Latesque Hall of Fame. And this was a shocker to everybody in Canada who pays attention to these things, because in Canada, there are organizations for publishers, for record labels, for artists, for this, for that. But in Quebec, there's one organization. It's Latesque. Everybody finds themselves sitting around the same table. And it's always been relatively sort of independentist in its orientation and very strongly run by this gem of a person, Solange Drouin, who has just retired, against whom I was always, as the chairman of the Canadian Association of Broadcasters, she was always asking for more stuff than we wanted to give them. We, anyway, we became really good friends. So we announced that they were moving their Hall of Fame to Calgary. And this blew the top of the brains off people in Ottawa who had always seen Quebec and the rest of Canada going like this in terms of music and culture. So this was a real big deal. Andre Menard came up to me at the end of the press conference where we announced this. And Andre Menard is one of the national treasure. This is the guy who started until recently owned the Jazz Festival in Montreal, a dear friend of mine. He walked up and said, Rob, even for an old separatist like me, I said, this looks like a really, really good thing to do. So we're the National Music Center. We're right now very much the Calgary Music Center and the Alberta Music Center, but we're increasing the conversation. Very much Calgary, Alberta, and Quebec represent the two polar opposites in most people's minds of what this country is about. They see the cowboys and they see the separatists. They see the prairies and they see the eastern part of the country. They see the English and they see the French. Well, I'll tell you what. Through these conversations that we're having between Alberta and Quebec, we're seeing more and more the similarities between these two parts of our country. I can tell you that on the numbers, Quebec has more right-wing militant groups than Alberta does. There are more separatists in Alberta than there are in Quebec. And I'll tell you what, Alberta and Quebec both love country music. I mean, I did a study for Sirius XM, which I mentioned earlier. They weren't doing really well in Quebec, and they hired me to kind of take a look at things. So I studied their offering, and working with Neil Kushner, actually, a former colleague from Sean, we said, listen, get rid of all this sport talk and American talk shit. Nobody wants that in Quebec. 
put in some French talent and a lot of country. And they went, country? What is country in Quebec? What are you, crazy? No country stations in Quebec. I said, well, they're not going to be in Montreal because country is a rural thing in Quebec. Well, there are no rural country stations in Quebec. I said, no, because the country stations, the stations in Quebec are mom and pops. They can't have a country station that exists by itself. You need numbers. And that's why there are all these networks of stations in Quebec. I said, listen, there's a festival country saint tip in Quebec, in rural Quebec, 500,000 people every summer. Hell, there's a rodeo in Montreal now. It does very well. So I'll give you an example. Johnny Cash is huge in Alberta. He's huge in Quebec. So Johnny Cash starts most of his songs with the A minor chord. I hear the train a coming. That's an A minor. I said being flipped. You walk into a bar in rural Quebec and play an A minor chord, folks' heads will snap around like saying squirrel to a dog. There are more things that are similar between Alberta and Quebec than are different. Our politicians have been fucking this up for a long time. The National Music Center is one way that we can increase the conversation between our polarities. That's what we're doing. And in the meantime, we're amplifying music, we're educating people, and we're sharing the strength of music. We have music and healing programs. And we've decided to break down our walls and push educational materials digitally into North America. We have a program called Evan the Educator, kind of a geeky Bill Nye the Science Guy sort of persona, who every week has produced a 10-minute video, which doesn't tell you how to play the guitar. It tells you why the guitar makes sound the way it does, or how a synthesizer works. And it's made for school kids, and it's being picked up by school boards all over the place. That's what the National Music Center is. You and I worked together on an application, an English one for Quebec City. And my big takeaway at the end of it was Quebec has more in common with Calgary than it does with Montreal. You're so right. It's that that's brilliant. It's socially conservative. The only place that the Conservative Party has any strength in Quebec is around Quebec City in the 418 area code. Calgary is socially conservative. Country music. You're so entirely right. It's not Montreal and Calgary. It's Quebec City and Alberta. Spot on. Good for you. It was the disdain that I heard in the people's voices. Quebec, even on the radio, has a disdain for Montreal. Calgary has a disdain for Ottawa. You're exactly right. I know a lot of people listen to this podcast. I know it's a lot of people in the industry. And I wish these kinds of ideas could be spread farther and wider. This national conversation, you know, Canadian cultural policy is a slippery slope. Our most recent Minister of Culture is actually an environmentalist. We're trying to develop Canadian cultural policy with a guy, to his credit, I suppose, who dreams of electric cars at night. Not about whether or not we're going to be able to recover intellectual property rights for our creators. We need to have conversations. We need more people like Melanie Jolie. There are people who will criticize Melanie, but when she was our Minister of Heritage, she was a powerful force for developing strong Canadian cultural policy and increasing the conversation. Her boyfriend's a luthier, for God's sake. I mean, she understands music. Not to say that Guibault was a negative influence, but let's identify the strengths of the people we send to Ottawa and where they can be used. In my humble opinion, and I tend to be careful about these things because I was a registered lobbyist for a period of time, and I do have a background in government relations, and I understand one has to tiptoe around certain ideas and concepts. But we need more things like La Disc talking to the National Music Center to create conversations which can be repeated to others, which can indicate that there are dialogues possible between not just levels of government, but between human beings. Emile Bilodeau is our little separatist poet right now in Quebec. We've got a new record. It's magnificent. Emile Bilodeau came to the National Music Center and did an artist in residence program. And we put on these programs and we bring people from all over the country. And Bell Media actually has paid for most of them so far. And they come and they stay in Calgary. And they live in Calgary and they stay in hotels and they eat in Calgary and they go to the National Music Center. And they're put in one of these magnificent studios, and they're given access to these 2,000 instruments. We also have the largest collection of electronic instruments in the world. Daniel Anwad did an artist in residence there, and he said, well, I don't need my studio anymore. So we got, you got more instruments here than I could ever imagine having. So Emile Bilodeau, our young poet, separatist, 
came and embraced the National Music Center and brought back what we're doing to Quebec. And that conversation rippled through his compatriots and his peers. Small thing, perhaps, but a little bit of a conversation that, you know, maybe there's something cultural that we can all talk about that isn't Aaron O'Toole and Pierre Elliott Trudeau and Max Bernier. Maybe there's some good out there to talk about. Thumping of chest here, gnashing of teeth, beating of breasts. I always thought you'd be a good CRTC commissioner. Would you take that job if it was offered? No, not a chance. I was talking about the vice chair a few years ago, and I said, no, no, not in a million years. No, that's that's not who I am. I had a remarkable career, Matt. I was very fortunate. I had a great spiritual leader in Gary Slate. I was very fortunate to have the love of some some important people and some great creators. And I was given an opportunity to fuck up. I did a couple of times, but as Leon said, I sang a lot of songs and made some bad rhymes. You know, I I think it's worked out well. I've got pretty good health and I can do what I want and I live where I want. And I drive a couple of magnificent cars and I travel when I want. Well, I will soon. (laughs) And yeah, I'm in love and everything's good. The radio review, which has been tinkered around, what needs to happen for radio? If you had a wish list or you could wave your hand or something that would make you a little bit excited about public policy and radio. Get off our backs. Get off our backs. Let us do what the marketplace requires. Reduce Canadian content. Reduce the amount of Francophone vocals the French stations have to play. Allow some more foreign ownership. Get some competition happening in terms of ownership. Come to the realization that 49th Parallel is not Trump's wall. It doesn't exist anything except in geography books. Understand that Canadian content was a huge, huge benefit to our country and our musicians, and that 65% Francophone vocals was a huge, huge benefit to the French industry. But understand that those days have passed, and that radio is no longer a thing for my 22-year-old daughter, YouTube is. There are no barriers to entry anymore. The CRTC has set up artificial barriers to entry. I think the CRTC is anachronistic. I think there are people inside of it that have some vision. There are a couple of people I can mention specifically that I won't. But it's a government bureaucracy, and it's staffed by a permanence that exists to justify its own existence. And I'm not being critical of any individual. I'm commenting on the kind of Western liberal democracy that we've wrapped around our shoulders. And that happens in heritage and supply and services and finance and foreign affairs, and it happens everywhere. It's kind of world we live in. And the CRTC is exemplary of that. And I think it's time for a fundamental reevaluation. I'm not a Max Bernier type by any stretch of the imagination, but I think that in order for the commission to become relevant again, it needs to take a strong step backward and start to enable as opposed to disable. So how did something like Bill C-10 land for you when you went through it or when you did your review of it? Well, I mean, it's dead now, right? So it's going to be reintroduced and it'll be somewhat different. There'll likely be a different minister. I know that the current minister will do anything to get out of that portfolio. And my guess is that probably one of the newly elected individuals will be given that portfolio. There's a great piece of writing in the Globe Mail a couple of days ago, which talks about the balance that prime minister is going to have to put together in terms of handing out ministries. My guess is there will not be an expert put in that portfolio. You know, C-10, I think we need a new Broadcasting Act first. I think that it behooves the federal government to figure out how to support content creators. You know, the Australian model makes a lot of sense to me. I think that something's got to be done there. I think that Facebook is being disingenuous by throwing a few pennies around to smaller publications and saying, look, we're being benevolent and uh, we're saving Canadian journalism by helping out the Squamish mail. I don't know that there is a Squamish mail, but you know what I'm saying. And I think that, uh, you know, some of the larger telcos are being disingenuous by taking a lot of the money the federal government handed out during the pandemic when they're paying dividends and massive bonuses to their executives. 
I'm not against massive bonuses. I got a whole lot of them when I was working. But I think that re-examination of how wealth is distributed in the media needs to be addressed. The Sound Off Podcast is written and hosted by Matt Kundal. Produced by Evan Serminski. Social media by Courtney Krebsbach. Another great creation from the Sound Off Media Company. Imaging courtesy Core Image Studios. There's always more at soundoffpodcast.com.